Welcome, everyone. It's my distinct pleasure to start tonight's event, to kick off the official launch of Houdini 16.5. Um, that's a celebration right there. It's a very special night because we get to reveal what we've been doing the last few months uh, publicly. So we're going to see a lot of great stuff. Um, R&D, as usual, has been packing a ton of features and enhancements into this release. Um, you'll see something there for everyone. I think of Houdini 16.5, actually, personally, I think of it more as a full release. There's so much in it. Uh, just masquerading as a dot release. Um, it's also special tonight because we're in Toronto. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, let's hear it for Toronto. Um, the, that's sort of, um, we, we, wherever we go around uh, the globe, we're always received with a warm welcome, but Toronto is home, home to the headquarters and the majority of the staff. So it's very special to be at home and doing a launch at home. And there's another reason it's special. This year we've been celebrating our 30th anniversary. That's the group gathering earlier this year, the staff gathering in Toronto earlier this year. And uh, what better way to celebrate the 30th anniversary than to uh, have not one, but two releases, Houdini 16 in uh, February and Houdini 16.5 today. And speaking of Houdini 16, um, we uh, are so happy with the, um, the feedback we've been receiving. Uh, the feedback has been amazing from the user community. Uh, we've seen the results uh, grow uh, in games and studios and freelancers and schools around the globe. We've seen growth grow across the pipeline from modeling to lighting and rendering. And we, all this increased feedback actually inspires us more. And that's why um, just nine months after Houdini 16, we're able to pr produce, the R&D department has been inspired to produce Houdini 16.5 here tonight. So without further ado, and to walk us through some of those features of Houdini 16.5, let me introduce our Director of Development, Kristen Bargill. Kristen? Thank you. Thank you, Kim. Thank you, Kim, and uh, good evening, everyone. It's wonderful to, to be here. Um, I think Kim is right. Uh, it feels to us like it was only yesterday that we released Houdini 16. Uh, time has gone by incredibly fast. Uh, I think it's fair to say that it was uh, the great response that you offered to, to that release and the feedback that followed it that put us here today um, so quickly and with so many features ready to show to you. Um, and I should clarify that Houdini 16.5 is not just an iteration on the features, many features that we introduced uh, a couple of months ago. It also contains a lot of tools that we had prepared for Houdini 17 that are ready already, and this is the way we are, you know us. Uh, we don't work with marketing sheets. Uh, uh, we don't wait to build a certain number of features before we say go. Uh, if something's ready, you know, we, d we put out builds every night, every morning for you. So if we have something ready for you that you can use today, we will do it right away, and that's what we did with a lot of the, the work that uh, is actually still ongoing for Houdini 17. So yes, Houdini 16.5 is feature rich, uh, but beyond that, I hope that what we're giving you is something that's relevant to you in production, because whether a feature, a feature is spectacular or, or small, big or small, uh, if it doesn't serve a purpose uh, to some of you or one of you or all of you, then we haven't done our jobs. Um, and I also hope one more thing that this release expresses not just the love that we have for the industry and for the work that we do, but also expresses the commitment that we stated to you already some years ago, that we want to continue to lead in visual effects while also very seriously tackling areas outside of that, like modeling and animation and, and you know, UVs and, and so on and so forth. So shall we take a look and see what we got? Scott, if you're ready. All right, this is Scott. So uh, Scott and I will be uh, presenting to you tonight. In fact, it will be much more Scott and, and not, not that much of me, which is fine by me. Um, anyway, these are the features, uh, the, the areas rather, that we want to cover tonight. Character, modeling, rendering, user experience, and dynamics. So let's begin with the first one. Uh, character. And you know, it, it's not just a random coincidence why we pick character first. Um, if you look at everything that we're doing for character, which is crowds, rigging, animation, muscle and flesh, grooming, 
it's a lot of stuff, a lot of work that we put into this release for characters. So it kind of deserves to, to be the first one. It also speaks to the needs of a growing community. Some you know, new arrivals to Houdini, some old, but equally passionate about delivering great quality characters and, and great quality animation. And also, there's a fine mix here between traditional rigging and animation and the things that we're really known for, uh, which is visual effects. So we have a nice blend and hopefully a nice balance between them. So starting with crowds, um, our goal there is to bring the crowds as much into the foreground as possible. In other words, to have that degree of quality of realism in, in the crowd system, that allows you to be daring with bringing them more and more into the foreground. With rigging and animation, that's pretty cut and dry. I just want to make it clear that we are very committed to that role. And we might come toward that goal from two sides, you know, traditional animation and, and then um, heavy duty effects. But in the end, the two of them should merge together and serve you better than each of them separately. And then muscle and flesh. Well, we did talk about that when we released Houdini 16. Those were the early days and we've been really busy um, improving what, what we put out then. So very happy tonight to tell you that these tools are now ready for prime time. And more so, uh, we've actually been backporting a lot of our work into 16.0 while developing the features for 16.5 and 17. But what you'll be seeing tonight are some things that we've reserved especially for you tonight that have to do with physical simulation, FEM and all that crazy cool stuff. And finally, grooming. This is one of those um, items that were meant for Houdini 17, actually, because we had put out a major new framework and, and, and well uh, endowed with features in Houdini 16. But in the end, uh, we got a lot done. And it's all very good production savvy work, um, which I think deserves to be released tonight. So that's my intro. Scott, can you take it from here, please? Sure. Thank you. Um, right, so we're going to start off uh, with crowds, and sort of as Kristen was just mentioning there in his, in his intro, um, you know, we've been very happy with the adoption of crowds out in the industry, and our goal is to go from, you know, what's essentially a background effect and push them more and more into the foreground. And the way you do that is you make uh, the tools more flexible, allow you to do more things with agents. So in this case, what we're showing here is something called a partial ragdoll, um, but also an idea called hierarchical, if I can get that word out, agents. Uh, which basically means the horse is an agent and the characters are agents and they're tied together but are able to obviously come apart like in this example. Um, and a partial ragdoll basically means kind of exactly what it sounds like it means. Instead of becoming a complete ragdoll, you see when he gets hit, the upper body becomes activated, becomes a physics-driven character, but from the waist down, he's actually still following the underlying animation clip. Uh, and then after a period of time, he goes full ragdoll and he sort of slides off the horse onto the ground. And these kinds of effects, the ability to blend not only animation clips, but physics and animation, and then all the way to full uh, physical simulation is how you make crowds more believable, how you can put the camera closer and closer to the crowd. So just really quickly, I just want to walk you through how you actually set that up. So here are just zombies. They're falling down. They're going full ragdoll. And essentially, all you need to do to create a, you know, a partial ragdoll is to identify which piece of the body you want to become a ragdoll. Uh, and the way we do that is with this uh, node called the transform group, agent transform group. And it really is basically just a matter of putting in which part of your underlying um, skeleton, the underlying rig, um, is going to become a ragdoll. And we have some nice little guide geometry here to show you. So for instance, the lower body or the upper body. And you can actually blend in as well. So if you don't want the, you know, the guy to fold in half at the waist when he becomes active, you can sort of blend in the physics uh, using this depth slider or even this ramp that you see here. For our example, we're just going to turn that off. And basically, we're pretty much done. We jump back over to our simulation network here. You can see we have the ragdoll state. And all we really need to do is turn on our partial ragdoll, input the group that we just created, and basically, we're ready to go. Uh, we can hit play. Our guys walk, and around here, they sort of flop over and hang. So you get this nice blend between animation and physics that sort of gives you a lot more variety than you could get by just trying to pump out you know, 
hundreds and hundreds of different animation clips for every possible scenario. Um, so here's just another example of a rider and a horse. And of course, he gets hit with this projectile, and then the horse hits this wall and falls over. So these ragdolls can be applied to quadrupeds as well, basically any kind of rig that you have driving your agent um, in your simulation. Um, and quadrupeds sort of uh, need some special attention. Um, so here we have something that's really interesting, which is actually keeping something in a full ragdoll state but then driving them using motors. So on the left, we have just full ragdolls. They're just hanging there. They have no animation at all. Um, on the right, they're still full ragdoll, but the lower half of the body is actually using the walking animation that you saw earlier. So if you look closely, you can see their legs sort of kicking and flailing there. So imagine having a, a suite of animations that are meant to be physical animations, right? That are half physics, half animation. So you can get this nice blend of uh, not just you know, on or off, but a blend of motion and ragdoll together. Um, so as I was saying, so quadrupeds require some special attention when it comes to crowds because of things like this. You have an animation of a horse running, you need them to make a tight turn, and realistically they need to sort of lean into that turn, right? And you obviously could make a bunch of animation clips where they turn left and right and so on, but this just helps reduce some of that overhead, reduce some of the artist time, and let some of the simulation take over, you know, those small details. Uh, another thing that's important is uh, terrain adaptation. We already had that for our um, agents, our bipeds, um, but for quadrupeds you need to pay a little more attention because obviously they have long bodies and more legs. <laughs> so uh, they have sort of special needs when it comes to adapting to a terrain, but we have added that uh, in 16.5. So moving on to character and rigging and animation. Um, something that we've done is we've taken something called the pose tool, and the pose tool was something that allowed you to get access to special animation handles, things like our invisible rigs that you're seeing here in the viewport where you just click on a piece of geometry and move it. And so we took it from this specialized tool and we actually moved it onto our toolbar here so that you can very quickly get access to these controls um, without having to sort of invoke this special tool. But not only that, we've also added at the top there, you can see something called motion path. So this is also a fast way to get to this idea of a motion path. And a motion path is essentially a, a space-time curve that follows the controls on your character. So you can see here this path through space. In this case, it's attached to this wrist controller on the, uh, the minotaur there. And you can basically, in 3D space, manipulate the path that that is going to travel through over time. And there's various ways to, to visualize this, path widths. Um, we can color the curve based on acceleration and so on. But you also have Bezier handles in the viewport to control this, these animation curves. And it just becomes a much more natural way for an animator to tweak a result rather than going into this sort of graph editor, which is a more abstract um, way of understanding how something is moving. Um, we're also adding uh, an auto rig system for um, heads. Now this isn't a full auto rig system, it's not a facial rig, you're not doing blend shapes and all that kind of stuff. This is a very um, uh, basic rig, it's a module that plugs into our existing um, auto rig system. But you can see it gives you a lot of nice controls right off the bat, like these look controls, you saw the jaw just a moment ago. Um, and things like this, about like how much uh, the eyeball influences the eyelids, for instance. So, even though this is not like a super complicated rig, it is a nice automatic way, quick way to set up a face for basic animations, um, but still gives you some nice, nice control, some nice deformations and nice control over the eye. Of course, in the future, we're gonna be working toward more complicated auto rigging for things like facial capture and so on, but for now, this is sort of a step down that road. So muscle and flesh is something that we sort of introduced in a sort of a beta state in Houdini 16. Um, and as Kristen mentioned, we have been sort of actually updating those tools all through the life cycle of 16. So if you've been getting um, daily updates, you've seen the new tools as, they, as they've been, as they have been built. Um, but here we have some new features that you haven't seen before, and that's this idea of anisotropic muscle contraction. So this is not a deformer. We're not deforming these muscles to create this motion here. This is purely in the simulation. We're basically triggering the muscles to flex. And what you're seeing here is the result of the simulation after we've asked that. So we say flex along this direction, and you can see they tighten up, they stiffen up, and they bulge because of all the nice volume preservation, all the stuff that comes along with FEM. And then, of course, we embed those muscles inside um, 
skin, essentially. And you can see that when the muscles contract and flex under the skin, they naturally pull the skin with it, and you get this nice sense of muscles beneath the surface flexing. And then on a more complicated sort of example here, you can see our Minotaur now running with the full um, simulation of the muscles under the skin um, and the effect, particularly on the sort of stomach and the pectoral muscles and his back. You get a nice sort of natural aliveness just by running this simulation. Um, one nice thing about our muscle and tissue solver is that you actually don't even need muscles. You, you can actually just run the animation on, from anything that has essentially a skeleton and drive a tissue sim on top of it. So you can actually work at any level you want. Full muscles, just skin, just driven by a skeleton. Uh, and now grooming. So here's a character that we've groomed using the tools in uh, Houdini 16.5. Uh, he's rendered, modeled in Houdini. Um, obviously the grooming is Houdini. And you can see, you know, you get a nice natural effect. Um, but really the purpose of the updates in 16.5 are, are to get you to the end result faster in a more sort of logical way. Um, so we've sort of changed how you approach fur. So we're going to walk through some of the examples here. And one of the biggest ones is that grooms now can um, be sort of piecemeal. So you can see we've added a groom to the head. Then we're going to add a groom to sort of the chest area here. And over here in the network editor, you can see we've created separate groom objects now. So instead of everything living in one groom, they can be broken out into individual grooms uh, and then merged together using this new sort of object level network. And the nice thing about that is that you can still get your full hair generation for your whole character but then each section of your groom becomes controllable individually. So you can see changing the length just of the head, but still getting a nice blend between that head groom and that body groom. And then a nice thing for, um, for people who are doing these kinds of grooms of short hair and long hair is we can now have different segment lengths per um, guide hair, which is something that we could not do in the past, and it really speeds up the way you work and makes it more flexible. So here's something that we're doing that's kind of interesting for laying down hair very quickly, right? So you want to get a basic groom. You're not doing anything detailed here, but what you want to do is set your overall hair direction. And what we're basically doing is with these uh, curves that you see being drawn interactively there in the viewport, uh, we're essentially advecting the hair through a field. So as you brush, you just advect the hair in the direction you want and let you very quickly lay down a base uh, a base groom. It's not super detailed, even though you can get in and add smaller details in places that you like, um, but it's a real fast way of building up a simple groom. Another new feature is this idea of taking a 3D shape, in this case these sort of uh, bangs and the goatee, and essentially filling them with hair. And this actually works in a very similar way to the last tool, in that we advect hair from the surface of the skin through this shape towards the um, outer skin. So you can see, you can basically model a 3D shape, which is something that you probably have anyway, um, and then fill it with hair in a way that makes sense, actually using a velocity field just like we were using in the previous example. And here you can see putting these sort of tufts of hair on the arm of the character there. <laughs> uh, and obviously, all the same controls you would expect from any sort of gr uh, grooming tool. Um, so something else we want to do is try and keep you as procedural as possible. It's very easy when you're grooming a character to start thinking about, I need to go in with a brush and brush every hair into place. And eventually you're going to do that. But we want to make sure that you have a lot of tools at your uh, disposal uh, to do things like mask off areas and apply procedural grooming tools to those. So in this case, we're just adding a lift to this sort of chest hair using that piece of geometry, the box that you saw. And this means that you can mask off areas and see the results sort of procedurally in your network here in a nice sort of intuitive way. We've also increased the ways we can use noise to mask out different parts of your groom, which is a nice way of breaking up your groom, making it less sort of even overall, um, giving us some more variety. You can see we've got nice lots of tools now for roughness and levels of uh, um, uh, noise. And also you can paint the attributes to paint where the roughness is, for instance. Um, and we also have some nice presets now for things like length mask. So this is a mask that says any hair longer than a certain amount put into a mask or hair shorter than a certain amount. And so again, it just gives you a nice intuitive way to control which part of your groom you're working on, which uh, tools, which styles are being applied to those areas, and then mix them together in interesting ways. Like this um, random mask multiplies against the previous mask. So you can see if you wanted to add gray hairs 
of white hairs, of guard hairs. This is a really nice way of doing it. So this whole system now is a nice uh, fluid way of working procedurally, but also directly in the viewport using sort of standard kind of brushing operations. Um, another nice thing is that we've tried to tie a couple of these elements together. So what's happening here is that obviously we have this fluid, um, it's affecting the hair simulation, um, but we're also doing a couple of things. We're using the attributes from the fluid to drive the groom merge that you saw earlier to mix between wet hair and dry hair, essentially. So this is actually a physical simulation driving a groom, which then in turn drives the actual shader as well. So you get the sort of wet hair effect in the correct areas. And that sort of ties into our whole philosophy of as much as possible making all the pieces of Houdini sort of communicate with each other so that you know, we don't have to work really hard to get these things to play nicely uh, together. And I think we're going to bring Kristen out to introduce the next section. Thank you, Scott. But just before we move on to modeling, maybe one more thought on character, which is as much as it's important to move quickly on feature development, it's just as important to have learning material prepared. And, and we know we've heard you, we've seen the forums. Um, people who want to dive into Houdini animation and rigging are asking for them. We've provided some, and now that we're at this stage with our software, um, we feel very good about starting some rapid fire tutorials and master classes on, on rigging, animation, and certainly the muscle and, and flesh, the FEM simulation stuff that Scott has just shown you. So that, that's coming up soon. And in fact, I know that we have a grooming master class, an update on what you just saw here that will be ready for the, with the release. Okay, so moving on to modeling, I've listed terrain meshing and you know, UV workflows as the main things that we've focused on for 16.5. It really is a continuum. I mean, software development is a continuum, but, but modeling in particular is very important to us because it serves so many needs. You know, um, we may not have been known for interactive modeling, but people have been modeling procedurally in Houdini, building sophisticated things since day one. So it is important because it is for traditional modelers, it's for VFX people, it's for generalists, it's for everyone that these tools are built. And we want to do uh, uh, not just a good job, but a great job. So our, our long-term uh, plan, vision, is to have a super competent polygonal modeler and with a top procedural you know, computational geometry tools in the industry. And, and hopefully this next iteration will, will tell you that uh, that's the direction that we're following. So uh, terrain was another one of those big entries uh, into the sort of Houdini landscape uh, with Houdini 16. Um, and uh, we have a nice uh, addition uh, you'll see in, in 16.5 and we're continuing with that. Uh, meshing is another big obsession we've, ha we've had for a while, starting with the, you know, the particle remesher and whatnot, and we have a, a quad remesher planned, but, but the, big, the big one uh, this time around is um, a poly reducer. And uh, yes, we've had a poly reducer for some time, but this is a completely new uh, algorithm and set of algorithms, and we're as excited about it as we were about the Boolean soft uh, a couple of months ago. This is its cousin, and, and not, not coincidentally, it was written by the same developer. So the other thing I want to say is as we, as we renew our software, and we do that continually, and in some cases we catch up, and in some cases we're, we're purely innovating. With every step that we take forward, we, tr we try not to just meet the status quo, but beat it. And this is one prime example of that. And Scott and I had so much fun putting together the slides. Um, we, we could have done this whole demo just, <laughs> just on PolyReduce, so, so check it out. And then UVs, um, that's one of those things that's become more and more important to us as, as we've been addressing the needs of uh, people in games, but not just, not just them, of course. Um, and it's not just workflow, you'll see there are some really cool tools and algorithms that we've prepared for you for 16.5. Scott? Okay. Um, so let's jump into Terrain. So uh, again, as Krista mentioned, Terrain was basically put into Houdini and Houdini 16. Um, and you know, a lot of the features that we're working on for the future were really planned for Houdini 17. 
Um, but this tool came along and it was ready to go, so we figured we may as well put it in 16.5 and let people play around with it. So let's take a look at a, an example here of something that is a very typical request. You have a piece of terrain, maybe that's a scan data, maybe another artist already made it, and there's a piece of it that you really like and would like to put in a different terrain. Um, if you just mask it out using the tools in 16, what you basically get is something like this. You, you do separate it from the landscape, but because it's on this hill and it's wobbly, um, it sticks up off the landscape, makes it very difficult to cleanly blend into another piece of terrain. So this new tool, this uh, height field patch tool, takes this patch and actually flattens it. It does some interesting <laughs> work to take this sort of very distorted thing and make it into a flat patch that you can apply to basically um, anything. So let's take a look at it on an actual example here. So you can see that same patch now and how it seamlessly blends in uh, with the terrain um, from this uh, patch that we've carved out. Now you can imagine that one that was sticking off the landscape, that would be much more difficult to blend in here, right? But because it's flat, it can basically glide over the whole surface of your terrain and blend in like this. And then obviously you put your shading and your texturing on top of it to blend it all together for your final uh, image. So this is going to be a, it was already sort of a requested feature, but I think it's going to be really helpful, especially for people pulling in multiple data to create a brand new landscape. Um, so on the modeling side, again, um, the, our uh, topology tools, our retopo tools, um, are just continuing to grow on every release. So this is something that we're calling a skin operation, where basically you just draw the curves, you can interact with it, you can bring a, a bridge across, and you can also draw the, the, the flow of the edges. So, and then of course smooth the result and get it all nicely blended in here. But again, this is sort of uh, bridging that gap between uh, somebody who wants to work in a really interactive way versus somebody who wants to work in a totally procedural modeling way. Um, something else that was often asked for is this idea of a geodesic or edge-based uh, soft radius. So you can see on the left our older version, which more or less ignored the topology. There is some, some following of the, uh, the face there, but you can see on the right that the soft radius needs to go around the mouth before it can start spreading into the rest of the face. And that makes operations like creating blend shapes or just modeling in general you know, much easier. It's an often asked for idea, but you can see here how annoying it would be to try and do this to the mouth um, if the uh, soft radius sort of just spread all over the face. A very typical example when you're doing blend shapes are things like eyelids, right? So you want to affect just the upper eyelid and not the bottom eyelid. And of course, you don't want to go in and create groups and all that kind of thing. Fingers are another big example here where Previously, this green mask would have spread to all of the fingers as you increase the radius, but now it stays nice and topologically consistent, making this a much nicer workflow for people who are doing this kind of uh, uh, character finaling or prepping for things like blend shapes. Um, something else that we really wanted to focus on is this interactive modeling in the viewport, but still you know, giving you nice tools. So here we actually have a new volatile key that you can hold down and you see this little widget showing you where your geometry is going to go. And basically you can quickly orient one object to the surface of another object just by holding down this hotkey and of course you get this nice uh, visualization. Um, there are multiple ways to do this. So in this case we're doing the same operation um, with a different modifier key to just do the alignment without the move. And then, of course, connected to that is the idea of just moving it without doing any alignment at all. But really, the whole point here is that, you know, we had a tool similar to this uh, previously, but it required you to go into a menu, select a bunch of points before you can move the object. And now this becomes a much sort of more alive thing that you can just do as you're working. And just to give you something a little more in context of how you might use this typically, we've got this bolt. We just want to slap it onto the surface of this uh, spaceship and then do a duplicate. So again, not a complicated modeling operation, but rather than having to break out of your workflow of being in the viewport and using our radio menus, uh, which is what you used to have to do, you can now stay in this workspace and work the way you kind of hope. You know, only leave the viewport when you absolutely have to. So PolyReduce. So PolyReduce is, um, as Kristen mentioned, completely rewritten from scratch. This is a completely new tool. And one of the interesting things about it is obviously it probably reduces things, um, but it also has some nice features built into it, for instance, caching. So this video is not sped up or anything. It's actually sort of a live video. So you can see that once we've cooked the initial um, reduction down to like 1% or something, 
Um, you don't pay the costs to redo that every time you change the slider. The results are cached all the way down to whatever level you did your reduction. So you can see that I can go from 1%, almost in real time, scrub this handle and go through all of the levels of subdivision. I think it caps out around 300,000 polygons and goes down to 1,000 or something like that. And again, this means that you can quickly find the value that you want without feeling like, oh, if I don't get it right away, I'm gonna have to pay this huge cost to redo the cook um, every time. Something else I should point out is that we are properly preserving vertex attributes like UVs. Um, and we can also, if I can get this to go ahead, <laughs> um, do something really interesting, which is preserve quad topology. So typically a poly reducer will only give you triangles as a result. But here, if you've given the, the poly reduction tool um, a quad mesh, you can actually preserve that quad mesh as you reduce. So this isn't a remeshing operation, right? This is actually just removing quads as you go and preserving all of your edge loops. So you can see how low you can get on that arm and still preserve the exact texture map, the exact UVs, um, but drastically reduce the number of polygons, but keeping that really nice topology that you worked so hard to get in the first place when you built your quad mesh. And this will be really important if you wanted to run the same animation, for instance, on a whole bunch of different levels of detail model. So there's lots of ways to control this. We actually don't have time to go into all the ways that you can control this. Uh, this this node is, is very powerful, has lots of ways to interact with it. Um, but one of the sort of clearest one is by painting a mask, right? So in this case, we've said, well, we want high density um, triangles in this area and low density triangles in another area. And obviously, that works pretty much as you would expect. And this is important, right? You, you've got a budget of 2,000 polygons. You want more of them in the areas that are important to you. Um, of course, this can be sort of adaptively done, right? So if you give it a soft mass, you get a nice soft fall off so you don't get those hard edges between the areas of poly reduction. And that's really important. Again, just giving you lots of control. This, but this is about density. You know, I want to put uh, more poly polygons here and less in some other area. But something else you can do is you can influence the weight of this reduction um, with the idea that you want to uh, keep a certain amount of information that you've given it. So let's just walk through a simple example here. It'll be clearer. So here we just have a basic piece of geometry with some UVs. And what we've done is basically baked out some lighting and then we've applied it directly to the points on our geometry, okay? And you can see on the right how dense the geometry is. And that's because we have all these sharp edges and so on. In order to keep that detail, we need a very high res mesh because we're storing it on the points. Um, so what we can do is ask the poly reducer to say, okay, take this information and preserve as much of it as possible while reducing the overall poly count. So rather than saying, I want more polygons here and less polygons here, instead you're saying, find where the changes in this is and preserve those changes so that the end result looks as much like the, the input as possible. So here we have our 2 million-ish polygon grid. And if I go forward, you can see now this is a drastically poly-reduced version, but you can see we've kept all of the sharp edges, right? And if we look at the underlying mesh, this isn't changing the density just where it happens to be darker. Instead, it's putting polygons where the attribute changes, right? So you can almost see a perfect outline of the shadow on the ground, but then in the perfectly black areas, it's done a lot of poly reduction because there's very little change in the underlying attribute. And a slightly more complicated example, here we've just done a, a soft shadow instead of a sharp shadow, just to show you how, so I just changed the slide there if you didn't, <laughs> if you didn't see it, how well it preserves these change in attributes um, along the edges so that it becomes you know, as much as possible that you can't notice, even though we've drastically reduced the number of polygons. And then here is the result. So again, in the middle where there's the darkest areas, there's also the little, uh, the smallest amount of change. And so the poly reducer has said, I can remove a lot of polygons in there because it's uniformly dark. Um, but around the edges as it fades out, it adds detail to preserve that sort of gradient from dark to light. So this is gonna give you a lot of power um, with how you shape your mesh, particularly if there's <coughs> attributes that you need preserved. Like for instance, sometimes a game artist will embed attributes to trigger certain sound effects on a mesh. And this will actually preserve those types of attributes as you go poly reducing it down to something more friendly to something like a game engine. So something else that's important is, you know, sometimes you want to reduce 
towards a camera, right? You're not just doing an overall reduction. You know this object is only going to be seen from a certain position. And so in this case, we're doing uh, uh, the second character here with the red. It's just a straight poly reduction without any weighting at all. It's just reducing it down to like 2,000 polygons or something. Uh, but on the right, we're doing uh, some weighting for polygons that are facing the camera, but also polygons that are on the silhouette. So if you look carefully, you can actually see that it's not just um, decimating the back of the model. It's adding more polygons along the edge where the camera can see sort of at a grazing angle. So just to make that a little more clear, so here's basically the same model reduced, and you can see how it matches up to the, uh, the starting point. And it does an okay job, but it's very jagged. It's very um, obvious that it's been poly reduced. Whereas if we look at this one with the, the silhouette preservation, you can see that the face overall is dramatically um, poly reduced, but the silhouette has m far more edges on it. And so it matches up to the original silhouette almost perfectly. And that becomes, again, really important when you're talking about this is a background element I know it's only going to be seen from this point of view, so you can go ahead and reduce as much as you want as long as you keep that silhouette. There's actually a whole lot of other things <laughs> involved with this. For instance, you can add a volume and say, reduce based on a person who's going to walk around this volume, reduce based on a path that the camera might follow, so anywhere this object can be seen along that path. There's a lot of features, but like I said, we actually just do not have time <laughs> to go through all of them. So a nice thing you can do um, with this tool is obviously do many reductions like this, take one character, reduce it, apply the same texture map to each one, and you get a really nice um, uh, retaining of the detail from the very high res down to just a couple of hundred um, polygons. The other thing is nice is that we actually did this inside of a for loop. So we just re repeatedly reduced and reduced and reduced. And because of that caching that I mentioned earlier, when you do a, an operation like this where you keep doing a loop and reducing and reducing and reducing, the cache um, is put back into the beginning of the loop each time. So you actually do less and less and less work on each loop. So the, the loops get faster <laughs> as the more of these reductions you do. So, uh, okay, so we've got UVs, we can preserve them. Now we want better ways of interacting with them, better ways of dealing with them. So here I've just got these two objects. Uh, they both have their own UV sets, um, obviously the green and the blue. So um, the new UV layout tool has a really nice feature that rather than putting everything into zero to one space, we now have this nice handle where you can select a region to pack into, right? So I can just interactively move this handle and say, this object is more important for whatever reason, so I'm gonna give it more space and leave room for my, you know, in this case, the hammer because it maybe doesn't have uh, as uh, much high res texture detail necessary. And so what you can do is pack obviously the green into this sort of top uh, two thirds and then the bottom third leave for the hammer. And that just gives you some flexibility about how you lay these out in sort of more of an interactive way. Um, the other thing is that these areas can actually overlap. So you can see that I've set the green um, UVs first and now this blue area that's being added, as I expand this region, find spaces between the other UVs to continue doing the packing. Right, so you can take things and sort of add, um, add things into the holes between your previous level um, of UVs. And so to tie it back to what I was saying about um, reducing these characters like this, here's the actual network that we use to do this. You can see it's basically just a poly reduce inside of a uh, for loop. But what we can do is every time we reduce this character, we can also reduce the UV space that it gets. And so you can see we can have one texture map to unify all of these materials, all the different materials that are on this object, and then uh, pack them into one UV space. So all of these different levels of uh, detail that you see here can be um, using one texture map, which is just a really nice, efficient way of dealing with large amounts of geometry like this. Um, so something else you can do is pack this information as tightly as you can possibly get it because UVs, you know, they benefit from having as much uh, texture resolution as possible. Um, and UV layout now can really find every piece of available space and fill it with geometry. Um, and then of course we have some nice new uh, capabilities in the UV viewport for displaying certain things like the boundaries of UV islands, if there's flipped islands, if there's overlapping. So if you've done this and you think there's maybe an error, you can quickly find it and do another packing with that in mind.
And this is just kind of amazing. I think it's packed like, when you zoom in there, it's really crazy looking. It looks like a city or something. So speaking of the UV viewport, um, here we've got just some small, advantage, uh, small updates that really just make your life a little easier. Basically, what you're seeing here is that as I select one of these objects uh, in the viewport, we switch our UV modeling view to those UVs. But something else we do is we check to see if it has a material applied, and if it does, we list out all the texture maps that are applied to that object. So you can quickly go in and say, I want to look at my rubber toy, and I want to look at it with uh, you know, its diffuse texture or its specular texture. So rather than having to go just in amongst all of your texture maps and find them, we sort of source them for you in this menu. Something else to point out there, you see that it says UV attribute and auto and UV. So in a big update that we've made that uh, a lot of people may not even notice, but it can be very important when you work with UVs a lot, is that UVs now can be just arbitrarily named attributes, right? So it used to be that you had UV1, UV2, and so on. Now you could make, you know, pig and toy. You just arbitrarily name your attribute um, and all of the tools will work properly with this new uh, uh, UV type. Um, and so we've also gone back and revisited some tools that we've added uh, recently to make sure that they automatically add UVs as you're working. So previously you'd have to make sure you created seams and edges and track what geometry you used. Um, now these tools will actually add um, UVs for you as you model. You can see them uh, uh, showing up here in the UV viewport, uh, which again just reduces the amount of work that you have to do um, down the road and gives you a nice interactive way of seeing exactly what's happening to your UVs as you're building them. Um, and if you look carefully at the interface, you'll see that there's some options for how these UVs adapt to the modeling, whether they stretch, whether they stay uniform. We're basically just showing the rectangular version here. But you can see how quickly you get this nice uh, UV layout for these three different objects, even as you play around with the parameters. And then obviously, if you would like at the end, just use UV layout to pack them into one uh, zero to one UV space. And we're going to move on to rendering, and I think we'll get Kristen back. Thank you, Scott. Thank you. Um, as many of you or all of you know, uh, rendering has been part of uh, Houdini's life since uh, the very first days, 20-something um, years ago. And some releases have big, spectacular uh, features um, on, with respect to lighting, rendering. And some are a lot under the hood. 16.5 is a lot about doing work under the hood. And the, the main thing that we focused on was performance. And that one has so many areas that it touches. Uh, for tonight, I'll just mention one or two. Um, Vex, which, which runs Mantra in a, in, a, in a big way, right? Our render is very much dependent on how fast Vex executes. Um, and so we've done a lot of work on the Vex uh, compilation and optimizations that we have a new. Uh, set of algorithms for VEX caching that makes things like um, the old uh, unified noise, for example, run much, much faster than before, and so on and so forth. Uh, we've looked at uh, IPR, making sure that it's reliable, that it, that it updates much faster. There's um, IPR autosave right now, and many, many enhancements like that. For something visual that we thought you'd enjoy watching, um, Scott will show you uh, the, the rounded edge um, tool that's been added to, uh, to Mantra. Well, it's actually a VOP as well, as you'll see. Some new interesting noise metrics. And for those of you who swear by Cryptomat, it's in. Thank you, Scott. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you, Kristen. So, um, the rounded edge. This is a very common issue with modeling where you have a cube, for instance. It has a very sharp edge, but things in reality rarely have extremely sharp edges but you don't want to have to go in and model all of those bevels everywhere. So we've added this rounded edge vault that gives you this rounded edge normal look, but also can do neat things like, for instance, create a, a mask on the edges of things. And in this case, I've just thrown some noise onto that mask so you can see how we've broken up that edge. Now we've got this red box. It's the same box before, just with this different uh, material applied. And now we can mix between them. So you get a nice rounded edge where those sort of gray metal bits show through and we get a nice shiny metal surface elsewhere. So this is a really, really useful tool when you're doing modeling. Um, 
especially if you're doing a lot of things using things like Boolean to do your modeling, because you often end up with topology that's difficult to work with, right? It's difficult to add poly bevels nicely over something that's been heavily Boolean. So you can see here very sharp edges on the wireframe um, where uh, the artist has basically cut holes and interesting bits into this um, object. But then at render time, you add all the nice bevels. So you get those nice highlights along the edges. And in this case, he's also worked in a bunch of different shaders together using this edge wear technique that I just sort of walked through um, briefly. And so this really is just a way of freeing you up, especially if you're talking about um, doing concept art or preview art or something where um, you know, the mesh is never going to animate. Nobody's going to do anything like that to it. You really are just interested in a final render. So in this case, you can imagine how if you did a, a uh, Boolean of all of these sort of holes into this tube, how difficult it would be to actually add a correct poly bevel to something like that. Um, but here, there's actually none happening. It's purely the rounded edge shader doing this at render time. Um, something nice about this as well is that if you were to bake this out to UVs, um, the rounded edge normals come into the UVs as well. So you can actually store that rounded edge detail for a texture map uh, down the road if you were going into games or anything like that. So here we have these noise metrics that Kristen talked about. Now this seems like something that's like, well, it's just some new noise. Um, and to a certain degree that's true, but this really allows you to create new types of looks procedurally. You know, this Manhattan and the Chebyshev noise gives you this sort of interesting almost biomechanical look to things. So if you imagine doing spaceship plating shaders procedurally, um, or even actually used inside of a height field to create really interesting terrain detail. Um, the Chebyshev noise gives you actually a really nice sort of broken up stony look once you add some distortion to it. So even though this is in a way a small feature, it's actually a really valuable one to people who are doing as much procedural shader building as possible so they can avoid having to constantly create texture maps when they don't have to. Um, something else we've done now in 16.5 is we've created this single SSS. So we've basically just given you a sort of this more simplified version of a, of a subsurface scattering technique that you can pull out and add if you just want to add a small amount of subsurface to something. You know, because it is this single SSS technique, it's faster and so on. But of course, you can still mix and match them however you like. Really just another uh, nice little under the hood change to give the artist a little more flexibility with how they approach hairless cats, I guess. <laughs> um, so cryptomat. Um, cryptomat is something that people have asked for a lot. And it basically gives you um, the ability to pull out masks for scenes like this. So somewhere where you have um, fog and volumes and a lot of different overlapping objects, uh, people will uh, sometimes turn to deep camera maps and things like that, but they have a massive data overhead. Deep camera maps are very large. <laughs> Um, especially when you have things like volumes and so on. And cryptomat is nice and lightweight. Um, so in this case, what we're going to do is take a look at the cryptomat. And, and what you basically get are these IDs for each um, object in this case, um, as well as this volume. But these aren't just IDs that you want to pull out. They actually provide the mask directly. So we also have a brand new um, cop to allow you to use the cryptomat uh, directly. So you can see here, um, and it's actually a little unclear in this slide, but basically we're selecting the, um, the fog layer at the bottom. And you can see I'm doing it directly from the name of the object, slash obj cloud from box object. So this is actually a metadata that you can access to create these masks. And it'll actually give you really nice masks even with these volumetric data. So you can see with that one flat image, you can pull out all these different masks. It simplifies your workflow for compositing down the road. Um, and just gives you a lot of flexibility without the massive overhead of something like deep camera maps. Um, and for your convenience, we've built this new cop to let you actually pull out those mats as well. So it's a nice little system tied all together between the uh, cryptomat rendering and the cop to actually give you access to these awesome uh, masks. And now we're moving on to user experience. All right, thank you, Scott, <laughs> again. Uh, user experience. Um, we know how important it is. Um, maybe in the early days we were more uh, obsessed with, with getting new functionality out. Uh, well, we, we still are. <laughs> uh, but, but now every work that we do, every feature that we put out, we run it through a very strict usability filter. And, and like, like everybody, I think we're learning. And again, I want to say how 
happy we are to see the, the incredible adoption that we've seen uh, since the release of Houdini 16 and how many great voices that has brought into the fold. And a lot of that has contributed and will contribute years to come in making our software more usable. But an equal thank you to those of you that have been with us for so long because you provide the right balance between what maybe used to be two worlds, which we'd like to bring into one. And, and make Houdini not just you know, a, a very productive tool, but a tool that you're happy to work in, not just with the procedural nodes and the, the tools that we offer, but in the viewport, you know, whether you're doing rigging, animation, whether you're modeling imperatively, to feel the same flow that, that you used to enjoy in your other packages. It's very important, and it does take a few steps to get there, but this is one big step along that way. Network Editor, well, this was a big release in Houdini 16, but we didn't stop there. There were some great pieces of feedback that came after that. We still have a, a fairly long list, but we, we've um, taken a couple of good bites right into those for this release. Um, the parameter dialog, that's very much the cousin of the, you know, of the Network Editor for Houdini users, and that one is seeing some really nice enhancements and um, I have a feeling that one of the features that Scott's going to show you that you'll be using on a daily basis may be one of your more favorite ones in this release. And then a hotkey manager, you could see a glimpse of it here on the, on the left. And then the viewport. And again, there's a lot of work that we've done there in the past couple of years. Some of it has been you know, catching up with, with the, the level of fluidity that, that you guys expect. And some of it is some new work that we are hopefully innovating with. Um, and all of them are coming together really nicely. Scott, can you show us, please? Sure. Um, okay, so yeah, the network editor. So, um, you know, obviously, again, a huge change in the network editor uh, in 16. Uh, these are not as huge, but they are very important. So something that happens very often, especially if you're modeling in Houdini, is you get these long list of nodes, and it's nice to be able to put them in a net box and hide them. So in Houdini 16.5, we now have an adaptive netbox so that when you close it, rather than leaving this huge gap in your network, it sort of compresses everything together. Uh, something else that was often asked for once we introduced uh, colors and shapes into Houdini is to be able to create um, a theme. So s your own custom set of nodes and colors, shapes, uh, node shapes and colors um, to apply to objects. So in this case, we're just making our light yellow, our camera black, changing up a couple of the shapes. And because we've created this new theme now, when I go ahead and put tab, camera, and drop down my camera, it picks up my new theme. So it's very easy for you to generate your own custom uh, node library shapes and colors. Some other things that are just uh, you know, a little more subtle is the ability to, for instance, take multiple connections from uh, VOPs and SOPs um, and plug them into corresponding inputs on other nodes. So in this case, well, <laughs> it's a little hard to see there. <laughs> So what I did there was selected three parameters and connected all three automatically in one click to the uh, node that's behind the bar there. Um, which again is really a small thing, but when you're working a lot in VOPs or you're working a lot connecting things together, it's a really nice fluid way of working instead of having to constantly uh, click, click, click. So the parameter pane. So first of all, you can see we have these uh, nice um, highlights on tabs and parameters. And those are parameters with non-default values. But we also have this new search bar. So you can see if I switch to parameters with non-default values, it hides all of the other parameters and only shows you the ones with non-default. You can see we have parameters with expressions, time-dependent parameters. Um, you can search for headings. So for instance, if I was to type shape, you can see we just get our shape tools and no other parameters in our pane there. I can search um, for specific parameters, in this case, OpenCL, but it could be just about anything, disturbance, for instance. Um, and this means it's very fast to find if somebody has changed something, something that you're interested in that you don't quite remember what it is. And then this is a really interesting one where you can actually search for a specific value. So in this case, 0.1, and every parameter with 0.1 um, is shown in the parameter pane. Density, in this case, uh, temperature. And so this really makes the parameter pane suddenly a much more flexible tool to work with. And you can even do neat things like create a list of search items 
and do sort of a quick customization of your parameter field. The other nice thing is that this little icon that brings open the search bar can be stowed and opened, and it maintains your search items. It doesn't clear them, and these persist across nodes. So if you do a search on one node and then go to another node, they both have their own search um, uh, parameters there, which now really just makes this uh, a lot more intuitive to work with, especially if you imagine somebody has given you a scene and you have no idea what they've changed you know, in the multitude of nodes. Simply changing it to non-default values, you can see immediately when you click on a node what things have changed, what haven't, what things require your attention as a new artist coming into a scene for the first time. So I think this combined with a feature that we added in Houdini 16, which is the ability to search your network. So you can do a network search to a particular node and then continue to refine that search inside the node itself. I think this is really gonna change the way people work with uh, nodes in Houdini. Um, so here's something else that happens a lot. So let's say a very typical thing to wanna do, I have this pig head, I wanna move it to the centroid of our rubber toy and people who have used Houdini a lot, they're very familiar with this um, expression called centroid. Um, it's extremely useful, um, but it is tedious <laughs> to type this in to all three parameter planes. Um, it's nice once it works, it's ready to go, it's great. Um, but through some feedbacks through from new users, we had the idea of like, well, can we make some of these things, these repetitive tasks that you do, a little more easier to, to discover? You know, if you know the centroid um, expression exists, it's very easy to type it in there. If you've never heard of it, you don't really know how to find it. We now have something called get reference or the reference menu. So I can go ahead now and right click on that translate parameter and you can see this new item called reference. I can grab scene data. I can actually use this tree to navigate or just click on the node or the object. You can see I'm going to my pig head or my uh, toy here and I can grab the bounding box and the centroid and hit accept and it fills in all three parameters for you and fills in the expression, right? So this again just makes your life just a bit easier, right? If you do this a lot, now it's much easier to do it. Um, but this is a very simple example. Imagine instead of wanting to do something complicated, like I wanna take the world space rotation of our toy here and I wanna apply it to this node called clip which basically slices our pig head in half. So in order to do that, it's actually a complicated series of expressions, it's not one expression. So I can go and get the relative world direction and you'll see that what it's actually done is filled in a very complicated expression here um, that would have been very <laughs> tedious to do multiple times. But you can see now how quickly I've set up this nice little procedural network um, using um, tools that are readily accessible to, to you even if you have no idea how to convert a matrix into another math thing. Um, <laughs> um, uh, another thing to point out here is that this reference can also reference local variables, which again just gives you a list. So if you're not familiar with what local variables exist, you get a drop down list. And also a very useful one, a local attribute. So whatever attributes exist, if you want to reference another node and get its attributes, you can directly go ahead and grab them. Something that we're not showing here, again just for time, is that you can also grab it from specific points, specific primitives, specific objects. So they're not just object level references, they can be right down to, I wanna get something from this specific point. You just select it in the viewport, it's very interactive. Um, so in Houdini 16, you know, for working in the viewport, we added these things called radial menus. Um, and the idea is just to make your life a little easier, right? You can sort of focus on what you're doing, you can stay in the viewport, you can quickly get access to these different um, um, operations. Um, and we bound them to some hotkeys that you could switch um, to get um, different types of radial menus depending on what you're doing. But very quickly, you know, it's very obvious that I may have a lot of these, I may have customized lots of my own radial menus, and it would be nice to be able to just assign them to any hotkey that I happen to like, not just a list that we happen to have provided for you. So now I'm going to our new hotkey manager, which shows you our, the radial menu you wanna create a hotkey for, what keys are available or taken at this level, you can very quickly apply a hotkey just by clicking that button, and now I just press that hotkey to bring up this menu. So the hotkey manager, you know, it's always existed, you've always been able to go there and do things, um, but it was very <coughs> cumbersome, it was complex to use, and it was difficult to understand uh, because you had to go through lots of menus and so on. We changed it into this much more visual way of working, and you just click on the thing you wanna create a hotkey for, 
you uh, bring up the hotkey manager and you can immediately set it using this nice sort of graphical user interface. Um, again, I think we're suddenly gonna get a lot of people setting their own hotkeys uh, while they're working now instead of uh, ignoring it because it was very difficult to use in the past. Um, something else that's very useful, especially if you're coming from the gaming side, is that we can now drive a camera in Houdini using a controller input. Um, in this case, it's the PlayStation 4 controller, but it could be an Xbox controller. And so this is a camera, a new camera type in Houdini, but it's actually being driven by a chop network. So this is not just a specific camera, it's actually a chop, and that means that you can do procedural effects on top of this controller input. You could record your controller input, add noise and jitter and so on. You could use this just to preview um, a, a level, like in this case, um, but you could actually use it to drive things because it's purely just a chop. And so in typical Houdini fashion, rather than just give you a controller, we gave you a controller and a giant toolbox full of other things you can do uh, with those controllers. And then something that's really amazing is uh, some of the enhancements we've made to the viewport when it comes to dealing with massive amounts of geometry. So this is a, a cityscape. You can see uh, you know, all the stats there above. I won't bother to read them. But the point is, you know, Houdini's been great at dealing with large amounts of data, generating large amounts of data. But when you're working with it in the viewport, it becomes you know, cumbersome. It's, it slows down your viewport. Um, but by changing some of these parameters, we can sort of live remove geometry from your scene to give you a nice interactive experience. If you look in the bottom right, you can see the FBS counter here. And so what's happening is that packed geometry or alembic data is being loaded or unloaded based on your viewing angle. And so when it swaps out the buildings, it just swaps in uh, bounding boxes. So you still get a feel of your scene, um, but without paying the price of showing you know, millions and millions and millions of polygons. And so when you're dealing with you know, these giant cities um, or any kind of large amount of data, it becomes really valuable to have this kind of interaction in the viewport um, to set up things like lights and cameras or shots or anything else that you might need to do um, and keeping it things sort of nice and light. Um, but you know, if you want to show 100 million polygons, you absolutely can. And we'll be moving on to dynamics. Well, this is last and definitely not least um, <laughs> dynamics. We put in a lot of work into physical simulation this release and we will in every minor or major release that we put out. It continues to be our bread and butter and uh, the place where we want to lead and in fact increase our lead mm -hmm. compared to, to everybody else out there. Um, so a couple of things um, this time around. Um, optical flow, well that's our foray into computer vision and we all know that there are so many uses in our industry or industries related to, uh, to computer vision and we can't uh, we can't wait to explore them. Um, in this release, we're using optical flow purely for VFX, as Scott will show you in a minute. Um, then air incompressibility, well, that's um, dealing with air entrapment uh, bubbles, but doing that in a, in, a, in a physically correct way that will help you implement more realism in, in those scenes that require it. Um, and then narrow band, which is, um, it's, it's just, I was going to say, just an optimization to flip simulation, but it's a very important one because while it may be, you know, prosaic in what it does, what it buys you in terms of productivity and, you know, and memory use is, is fantastic. So without further ado, let's talk about dynamics, please. Okay. Um, so optical flow. So uh, the idea, in case you're unfamiliar, is to take a source, uh, a 2D or a 3D source, and create a flow field from it based on the sort of implied motion. Um, something that we're not gonna show today, but it's very important to point out, is that this also works on 3D sources. So if you had moving 3D things that had completely different topology on every frame, and you needed to generate um, a velocity field from it, you can actually do that now, um, much in the same way we do it for 2D images. So the idea is once you've take, created that flow field, you can apply it to effects, effects like this, for instance. Um, and really, this is just a fluid simulation um, with the color from the video put on the particles. But every, all the motion that you're seeing here is driven from that um, flow field. So the, the image itself is actually driving the simulation and pushing the particles around. And I think this is going to open up a lot of really cool, interesting effects. It's also going to be something that people who are coming from 
um, film or broadcasts who are working in motion graphics are really going to probably love because you can see it creates this really dynamic, interesting look while still maintaining the look of the 2D uh, video. And here's just an example of what that actually looks like from sort of a three-quarter view. So you can see how it's creating these large splashes as the flow field moves through the fluid. And just to give you an example of how this is actually working and how easy it actually is to plug into your sim, you can see we just bring in our footage through COPS. We use our new COP2 network from 16 to pull that into Sopland. Then we have this node called Volume Optical Flow. These are pretty much the defaults. And we can go ahead and visualize the flow field, you know, not quite real time, but very quickly. And so the idea here is that you can work that fast, bring in, bring in your footage, tweak the results, Using a standard node, pop advect by volumes, we can pull in that velocity field into our dynamic network and immediately start pushing around our fluid simulation. And so again, not only is this a new tool that give, opens up these new interesting possibilities, we also made sure that it all sort of plays nicely with each other because we want you to be able to go you know, from COPS to SOPS to DOPS or in more human speak from compositing to geometry to dynamics. Um, and that sort of seamless blending between those contexts is really important to us as we move forward with uh, new versions of Houdini. So here's just uh, another example now again of this fluid simulation pushing around, uh, being pushed around by the, um, the underlying uh, uh, flow generated from the image. And then we have actually a completely different type of simulation using the same effect. So this is actually a grain simulation. And you can see how it, it's using the exact same flow field, the exact same data, but creating this completely different impression, the feeling that there's almost something underneath the ground pushing these particles around. So you can very quickly start to imagine not only really cool effects you could do with something like this, driving effects using you know, 2D animation, um, but also anything involving motion graphics or anything like that where you want to do it. You know, I could very easily envision you know, a title sequence using these types of effects. So it really just broadens the possibilities from effects all the way to more traditional 2D style rendering effects. And it just looks really cool. Um, so air in compressibility. Um, and I'm not gonna say that anymore, so I'm gonna say bubbles from now on. Um, on the left, you know, this is how the uh, flip solver in Houdini dealt with air, which is to say it didn't really deal with it at all. So you see the fluid just pours out. And on the right, you get that typical water cooler glugging effect as air that's in the lower sphere needs to move up into the upper sphere in order for the water to change um, containers. Something important to point out with the system that we've developed here is that we're not using air particles. You know, there's, not, there's not a separate group of particles to track where the air is. We actually track the surface of the fluid itself and um, discover air pockets and then maintain the pressure within those pockets. Um, and that might seem like a, you know, a distinction that doesn't mean anything, but if you imagine something, um, uh, something more like this, where you're generating lots and lots of particles, that whole empty area above the, the tank there would also need to be filled with particles. So it's an optimization on top of everything, as well as a simplification of your workflow. So in this case, in order to create this effect, all you need to do is cut holes in your source, right? So you just use a sink to cut holes in the surface and it automatically will be created as a bubble and maintained in the fluid simulation. So it's not just uh, an interesting technical detail, it actually directly affects your workflow, simplifying it drastically. The other thing that's nice to know is that it behaves correctly with the other tools that we've built in our fluid solver, things like viscosity. Uh, you can see you know, the bubbles behaving very differently on the very high viscosity fluid here and on the left working basically like a water cooler. I was actually gonna record a little workflow demo to show how all this stuff works, but it literally is just turning on the button called air incompressibility <laughs> and then bubbles work. Um, so it wasn't really worth showing you a video, uh, but the results are very cool. Uh, this is maybe a little harder than just pressing a button, but it's still a very cool um, result that would have just been absolutely impossible in the past. Um, so narrow band. So um, what we're showing here with this shark jumping out of the water, this is a pretty typical type of effect. You have a large tank of water and there's something in there splashing around or doing something interesting. 
Um, the problem with these effects is that the reality is the interesting bit is only at the surface, right? You basically don't care about what's happening below the surface, but you're paying a pretty significant cost to simulate it. You need a deep tank of water to get the correct uh, type of motion at the surface. So what narrowband allows you to do is say, well, I'm going to simulate that just using um, a volumetric approach. And I'm going to maintain the surface using this narrow band of particles. And that way you maintain all of the interesting detail at the surface, you get all your splashiness, everything you'd want from a fluid simulation without paying this heavy cost of filling this entire tank with particles and simulating that, transferring data from particles to volume back and forth on every um, frame. So it saves you a lot of um, memory because you don't have to deal with that many particles and it also saves you simulation time because for the same reason, you don't have to deal with as many particles, you don't have to transfer data back and forth as often. And the nice thing is it doesn't really have an effect on the result of your simulation. Here you can see you know, a billion particles, this spaceship rising up out of the ocean. And apart from the fact that we're telling you this is narrow band, there's nothing to actually tell you that this is narrow band. The result of the simulation should basically match um, what you had previously, but as you can see with about a third of the memory and three times the speed. And so this is a, a massive improvement to dealing with these enormous tanks full of tank full of water. <laughs> um, and the nice thing is that because you know it has much less memory, if you're a smaller studio and you're trying to compete on these fluid shots, you don't need a giant computer with you know 300 gigs of RAM or something to pull off these simulations. You can do it at a much lower uh, amount of RAM and still get a really nice, highly detailed um, result. And again, this just looks awesome. And so that actually, believe it or not, comes to the end out of our uh, presentation on new features. So I'm going to bring <laughs> Kristen back up. Thank you, Scott. <laughs> Great job, Scott. Thank you. Uh, Houdini 16.5 releases on November 7th. In a couple of days, we're just uh, getting a couple of kinks out, uh, finishing our docs. We have those master classes to, to finish up as well. Uh, but in a couple of days, it's all yours. There's lots more to discover there than, that, than what we've shown you. Uh, we hope you enjoy it, and we hope you do great things with it. And we'll see you in a couple of months to talk about 17. Uh, <laughs> And just before we end, uh, I'd like to uh, give big thanks to our R&D team. That's uh, all our developers, our TDs, including Scott here. <laughs> our uh, documentation and QA, and uh, our interns. And the amazing thing is that some of the features that you've seen today and that, that you'll get to enjoy in 16.5 were developed by our co-op students, uh, the majority or of them or all of them from the University of Waterloo. Uh, and a couple of them just joined us uh, a couple of months ago in September and some of the features are up here. So big thank you to all of them and to all of you.